All right, welcome everybody to our third Herplus Data event, which is online. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, just some general guidance for tonight. Um, do please be kind to yourself and to others. Um, you know, we've all been, you know, in lockdown for a while now. We're all tired. I know I was in online conference calls all day. So if you have to leave for any reason at all, um, please feel empowered to do so. Um, this event is being recorded and we're going to share it afterwards so you can always catch up then. So please do turn on your video if you are happy sharing your face um, or turn it off if you do mind and also the same with any um, names, uh, your username. Um, please keep yourself muted when not speaking in order to minimize the background noise for our speakers. Um, please feel free to engage and ask any questions in the chat and you can also private message me with any issues that you have. And then finally, please do not share the Zoom room link publicly and that's just to avoid um, any Zoom bombers. Uh, so we do have a code of conduct tonight. Uh, we don't tolerate um, any harassment of any kind. Um, just in general, please be kind to everybody. Uh, we want to be as inclusive as possible. If you do experience um, or want to report any misconduct, uh, please feel free to uh, either private message me here in the chat or you can email the herplus uh, data mcr at gmail.com in order to report anything and we will follow up with you and you can read the full code of conduct on our meetup page. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to express our support and solidarity with our black community. Um, we do know you're exhausted and hurting from living with the trauma of systemic racism. And although we do strive to make this community um, a safe space to support and celebrate you, there is always more we can do to help relieve some of that burden and help dismantle racial oppression within STEM. So we've been sharing um, anti-racist resources and promoting local communities and people who champion diversity and inclusion within the tech sector on our social media, but we can also do more to educate non-Black people within our community using our platform. Um, so I'll be sharing some resources in the chat that I personally have found extremely useful. They contain lists of anti-racist books, podcasts, films, and other media to learn and also unlearn more, um, as well as links of where you can donate, petitions you can sign, and how to contact your government uh, representatives. Um, also, if you're looking for local concrete actions you can take, um, Diverse and Equal Tech Northwest are having, um, I have a GoFundMe to help raise funds um, to support research and training initiatives um, to help identify the barriers for, uh, to entry for Black people in UK tech, discover how to support Black employees already working in the industry, and to get visibility on how tech is impacting Black lives. Um, so there's an extremely powerful post that um, Annette uh, the founder of uh, Diverse and Equal Tech Northwest, uh, Annette Joseph, wrote. I cannot recommend more that you read it. And also, she has a huge list of resources. Um, and then the GoFundMe is linked there. And I'm happy to chat more um, after all the talks about any of this, if you would uh, like to learn more. Um, but about Herplus Data, uh, our mission is to bring together women with a connection to data to provide a safe space where we can support and celebrate each other, share experiences and knowledge, establish meaningful connections, and talk data. Um, we are your organizers, so my name is Rachel. I'm at, based at the University of Manchester. Uh, Mona is also an organizer as well as Bernadette. Um, I don't think Bernadette can make it tonight, um, and if Mona's here, she can wave, although I can't see everybody's face at the minute, so apologize. Um, apologies if I miss you. Um, our community has grown um, wonderfully over the past few years. We've been going for three years now. Um, I like to show these group photos um, at the beginning, and that's just to give you a warning that I'll be taking a group photo at the end of my announcements, um, which will just be a screenshot in this case. So if you want to turn off your video, um, now would be the time to do that if, if you wanted to show up as a black square on the bottom. but. It's been an interesting few weeks. Um, but our events are the second Thursday of each month, so save the date. So our next event is on July 9th at the same time, and we'll be making an announcement about that soon. Uh, we're also open to um, and actively seeking collaboration on events and adding more events to our normal meetup schedule. Um, so do please get in touch if you want to collaborate or if you want to speak in an event, if you want to suggest speakers or topics. We, um, this is your community. Uh, we want to um, we want to provide what, what you're interested in. Uh, you can connect with us on Meetup, Twitter, email, and Slack. So if you want to make those suggestions or get in touch, um, there are many uh, pathways to engage with us. 
Um, a huge thank you to uh, Bernadette, who couldn't make it tonight, but and also Evolution uh, Recruitment Solutions, where she works, for supporting our um, meetup from the beginning. Um, and of course, a thank you to the Software Sustainability Institute, um, whose uh, fellowship funds have supported um, the cost of our meetup page. So we've got a really amazing event tonight. I'm really excited about it. Um, it's been a long time coming for our collaboration with Open Data Manchester. We've been friends for a long time, but I think this is the first event we've actually collaborated on. So we're very excited for this. Um, we have brilliant talks uh, from Hera, Alice, and Sophie um, tonight. So we hope you really enjoy their talks on data for social good and sustainability. Um, so now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to take a group photo if that's all right with everybody. So if you would like to be in it, um, feel free to unmute your, sorry, my cat, feel free to unmute your um, video and I will count down. But thank you so much for humoring me. I like to do this at all our events. All right, three, two, one. Perfect, thank you so much. And now I will hand over to Sam from Open Data Manchester. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, I haven't got any slides. I won't take a couple of minutes of your time. Um, but yeah, firstly, just thank you so much for um, inviting us to this collaboration, Rachel. Um, yes, I'm Sam. I'm the Program and Events Manager at um, Open Data Manchester. If you've ever been to an Open Data Manchester event or workshop in the past couple of years, chances are you pr we've probably met. Um, but if not, I just thought I'd give a quick overview of some of the work that we do. Um, we're a small team, but we work really well, openly and very collaboratively. So uh, we've actually worked with, closely with uh, Hera and Sophie here in the past and in the present, I suppose. Um, so Open Data Manchester, we're, we're a CIC, uh, not-for-profit, uh, that was formed from a diverse group of open data advocates back in 2010. Um, and we support organisations to release data and we help people to use it responsibly, intelligently, and as ethically as possible. So um, we build and support good data practice through um, advice, advocacy, consultation, but we run lots of events, conduct research, we give technical support and tailored training as well. And that can be for local authorities, um, public, private, charity sector, academia, um, but also communities and individuals as well. So anybody who really wants to use data and open data for good. Um, but like Her Plus Data, we are a community and I think that's how most people know us is through our monthly meetups, um, which we used to run in pre-pandemic times. Um, so yeah, so as I say, we work really collaboratively. We're super happy to be sort of teaming up with Her Plus Data tonight. Um, we, we like to try and give opportunities for our community um, to come together, to showcase their work, um, collaborate, learn from each other. So um, just a little plug here, you might know that we've been running a weekly pick and mix, what we call a pick and mix series uh, every Tuesday night. Uh, we have a session that is run by someone from the Open Data community, Open Data Manchester community, introducing a new skill or resource. So we've had sessions on uh, QGIS, uh, web scraping, data analysis, SQL, all of these are available to watch and catch up on online via our Vimeo account. Um, we like to make all of our training and resources openly available. And um, coming up, we've got sessions on reusing data on R, and we've just added two more sessions, uh, one which is going to be on GitHub, which is going to be run by Rachel here. And I'm just finalizing a session on using APIs. So if anyone's interested in joining those, I will put the links in the, um, in the chat, along with the links to the, the Vimeo as well. Um, but we also run open data surgeries. These are monthly things where you can come and chat with us about a project that you're working on, perhaps you want some advice or you just want to share it with us or you're looking for a collaborator, we do, we'll do our best to help you. Um, the next one is next Friday, actually, but, but you can always reach out to Open Data Manchester um, at any time via the usual channels. Um, we are about to launch our new website in about a month's time, so there'll probably be a bit more better ways for you to engage with us and connect with us then. Um, so yeah, we're um, just really, really happy that we're doing this event with you all tonight. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from the, the three fantastic speakers we've got lined up. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And, and thank you to all of you. <laughs>
Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. And just a quick announcement after the three speakers, we will um, hang around until 8 p.m. in case you want to stick around and network at all and chat to each other. Um, but otherwise, we'll go ahead and we'll hand over to Hera. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me, um, especially, you know, Rachel Scat. I think that, you know, it's such a great when events start with more catch time. Uh, I have my cat sitting right next to me, you know, approving all my slide selections. So I hope that you, your pets, your family members and friends are happy and like having um, as, as peaceful a week as we can, given the circumstances. I think it's been a very heavy, heavy week. Um, and a few months, so um, I will um, I will share my presentation with you. I do have some slides, but I will speak for uh, maybe twelve to fifteen minutes, and then I'd love to just chat with all of you because I'd love to learn from you too. So um, I am going to start sharing my screen now. Here we go. Let me know if you can see it. I think I can get yep. yep. that's great. Okay, great. So Okay, so I, uh, my day job is working for open contracting, which is a nonprofit based in uh, DC, but we have, um, we work across the world, we're a 14 people team, but we work with 40 countries across the world around opening up government contracts because it is so important that more people have transparency on how taxpayers money is used um, and and not only um, how it's used in the fact that how it's assigned but also how is it implemented um, you know public procurement or government contracts are uh, a government's number one corruption risk and um, you know often people when I, when I talk about this, people think about um, countries in the Middle East, in Asia, in Latin America, when they think about corruption. But actually, you know, um, it would surprise some of you to know that the UK is one of the largest like hubs of illicit financial flow uh, because of London's property market, how easy it is to open a company in the UK. So various reasons combined. So it is actually, in fact, a study just came out two days ago, which said that uh, twenty five percent of local authorities in the u k had come across a case of corruption when it came to procurement, so that will tell you like how important this is. Um, so we work with government, business, and civil society to convince governments to open up their like procurement processes and data that like uh, un underlies everything and to monitor it. We have a thing called the open contracting data standard, which is like one of the um, a world-class data standard um, and I wanted to go through its JSON data standard It is completely open it's like owned and governed by the community which is global and has everyone from like data analysts to journalists civil society activists and you know public policy people um, we think when we think of government contracting we think of them in five stages so when I, you know planning stage where a contract is planned, uh, the tender stage where, you know, it goes out to tender when a contract is awarded, the actual contract document itself and implementation. So this data standard has enough detail in it and flexibility in it that countries, you know, from Colombia to, to Canada can use this uh, to publish their, and not just countries, but actually cities as well. Um, and we've been trying to get Manchester City Council to do this um, and uh, it has not happened. So, uh, but like there are councils in the UK that are starting to publish this data. So what does the data standard actually look like? It has things like documents and notices, key dates, when was the tender start date, when was the tender end date. So you can imagine the really, really rich data comes out of it, which makes it really easy to then build like, other tools on top of it. Things like Ukraine has built um, an AI uh, a tool which takes all the data from its public contracts, which are based on our OCDS, our Open Contracting Data Standard, and then also checks the details across like common red flags of corruption. So for instance, like the name of a minister, you know, if a minister's name or a company that they are a director of comes up in a procurement, it flags it up so that it is then escalated and then it has to be checked. But the problem in a country like UK is because our data is so badly structured, even though it is released as OCDS, UK was one of the first countries to pledge uh, to open contracting and releasing data in that data standard. The quality of it is so bad that um, 
it is not possible despite us having very rich data sets on directors and beneficial owners. So who really owns companies and having rich data on somewhat rich data on contracts. We actually can't do that. Our data like cleanliness and like hygiene is just not there yet. So, um, this is an example, which is like probably one of the most shocking examples that we have, and I wanted to share this. So this is what the Ukraine's like procurement authority looked like before the, their 2014 um, re like revolution that happened there, the maiden revolution. And then after this, they basically raised their um, procurement processes to the ground. They started from the ground up and they built a procurement system that was completely based on transparency and the open contracting data standard. So this is what their dashboard looks like now. Um, and it is open and it sits down for maintenance and it is, they've saved more than a billion US dollars by doing this. So anyone from the public can go and see who is winning tenders and what's happening. Um, and they've uncovered a lot of cases because of it. Um, in fact, the perception of corruption by businesses has gone down by 50%. And in Colombia, it has resulted in busting a price fixing scandal, which was, uh, you know, making the, the cost of school meals delivered to school children really high. There were only 13 or 14 companies delivering it to a population of, you know, 700,000 meals served every day, which, which now after they put in, uh, it, they created an e-market, they opened up their systems, they changed the regulation. Um, and they really took a data centered approach, an open data centered approach. They now have more than 40 businesses that are delivering these school meals, are tendering, and it has not only you know, made it much cheaper for the city, so they've reduced prices by 45%. It's also improved the quality of the meals. So I thought we have a bunch of data analysts. Why don't I share with you some tips for finding like corruption red flags in procurement data? So if you are someone who's interested in looking at this data set, you can go at Contracts Finder uh, in, the, um, in the UK and you can download that data set. Uh, there is an API and you can do some of this analysis yourself. If any of you have been covering the COVID related news, you would see that there have been a lot of contracts that have been highlighted. So I'll take, give you some tips on how to do that yourself. So it could be some of the like things that you tell you that there might be something wrong. So it's a flag. It doesn't mean there is something wrong is that for instance if you notice that there's a very short notice to bidders or you know that there is a very vague supply uh, description of supply items or when it comes to the award stage there is a high number of uh, awards that are going to the same bidder this does happen in the uk actually especially when it comes to management consultancies they tend to get a lot of awards um, or and this one is going to sound familiar to someone uh, or people who've been reading the news bidder that has never previously been wins tender so maybe something like a t-shirt company producer who suddenly becomes you know, an expert in PPE production. So that is an example of that being problematic or a supplier that seems to be a ghost. We can't find any information on them on the company's house. Um, the contract stage is harder in the UK because we actually don't release the, like the government doesn't release the actual contract document. You have to get that through the freedom of information requests. When those are available, you can actually go through it and see, um, and you can find out what um, those things are. So next, I'm just gonna whiz through some of these to then share with you um, other examples. So here are some examples of some stories that have been related to COVID-19 and the, the kind of like corruption scandals that have come out all the way from like the feds giving a former White House official three million to supply of masks, uh, which didn't work, to, you know, uh, like politicians being connected with suppliers, to um, the fact that actually when it comes to the EU, there was a whole thing around how the UK not being in the EU and actually um, not being part of the talks around PPE sh shortages also, um, so uh, PPE supply and ventilator supply routes meant that there were shortages. And there's another case from Portugal. In Spain, they lost, I think there were a billion tests that were unusable because the quality of implementation was so bad. Um, single bids in the UK are increasing um, as in a lot of the other countries in Europe and single bids usually are very bad because it means that your market is not competitive. This is all the kind of data analysis that anyone can do when you have that kind of powerful structured data 
set, which the OCDS provides. But now I'm going to switch tack and I'm going to talk to you about something else. So there are more slides and you can actually have a look. I can uh, drop in the link to the slides afterwards. So there's something else that I do, which is I run a nonprofit, uh, which I will be going full time on. Actually, I've been running it as a um, in my spare time for the past seven years. And I'm going full time on it from the 1st of July. So it's very exciting. And um, it is all about open, but a different kind of open. So it's not open data, but it's more open knowledge. So it's about how do we um, open up the information that can help survivors of abuse get out of uh, abusive relationship situations. So Chen creates uh, resources for survivors of gender-based violence. Here are some of the things that people have said about our work. So we work uh, we create resources for survivors, but also for like frontline services who don't have the time and resources to constantly creating new stuff. So all of our things are open source. I'm going to show you some examples. So we create guides, platforms, and recently digital services. Everything is trauma informed. So it's like recognizing and understanding the effect that trauma has on someone and the fact that people with multiple identities um, and, you know, things like race, gender, um, and ability and disability can affect someone's experience of trauma as well. So we, we, all of our stuff is designed to be as inclusive, hopeful, and something that builds trust with users and really creeps, uh, keeps privacy at the heart of it. We never lock users into creating an account. It's all free and open, but they can create an account if they want to. Up to 70% of our volunteers are survivors of abuse, which means that actually not only is the stuff that we're producing really high quality because it comes from personal experience, but by in the process of creation, in the process of creating these guides, we are empowering people who have been disempowered in life. So it is a very different bottom-up approach to doing this kind of work. So some examples of the work that we've done. So we have like guides available in up to nine languages. Um, you can all have a look at it at the website. Uh, we have a chatbot um, that just directs people to different services and different guides on our website. We have a micro course platform, which again, all of this is open source. So the code is open source. You can go and check it. You can create your own repository. And because it's so well structured, it's now being translated by refugees in, in Belgium. So we've had Turkish, Albanian, and Russian translations in the last four weeks uh so it you know when you open up the way of working it becomes so easy like they contacted us and within two weeks we had the translations up that they have submitted and up on the website and since covid19 um, and lockdowns we've been doing a lot of work to support uh people who may be trapped in abusive uh situations um and we launched a new program which is really like um, I think probably one of the best examples that I have of really fast prototyping. We came up with a 10 week course in seven days. We've spent more than 500 volunteer hours delivering a service of like providing safe and confidential like trauma support through Telegram, uh, which is a messaging app like WhatsApp. So um, yeah, I wanted to leave you with this thought of like how even under the constraints of like not having money and working only with volunteers and having very little time, you can actually create something from the ground up that can deliver a lot of impact. And um, that's it. This is what Chen has achieved over the past seven years. And I'd love to uh, hear from you and answer your questions or just, you know, learn more about what you all do. Thank you so much, Hira. Can we give a nice virtual round of applause for Hira? Woo! Um, does anybody have any questions? There is one question, which is about confidentiality. So it is really important for us. We have, um, we, I mean, there's on, on the website, there is a button that lets you exit the website and it hides where you were. It doesn't, it doesn't like delete the, uh, the fact that you were on the website because that's actually not possible. Like only a virus can do that. So you can't do that. But none of the services are locked down. We use Telegram for that very reason, because with WhatsApp, it's much more discoverable um, as people are using it. So we chose Telegram. But I guess the, the thing that I'm going to say here is that people often tend to generalize as well when you talk about it, like the experiences of survivors. We found that not all survivors are as worried about like 
uh, discoverability as others because not everyone is in an abusive relationship. We work with survivors of sexual assault where they're they are they are not in a confined space where they're like you know the person who assaulted them. So they, that for them for them like getting a message on WhatsApp is way better than getting it on Telegram because they never check Telegram. But for others, it's really important. So we have it on Telegram. So we try to provide as many different avenues for someone to get that support. So for Soul Medicine, which is our micro course platform, people, people can actually indicate what time is the safest for them to receive a message from us and uh, which, which from the micro courses that we have on there. And they can also select like disguised subject lines. So things like 99 ways, like, you know, Beyonce rules the world or six ways of using, you know, mint, you know, this season, something like that. So we have, we try to like embed all of those things in, but not lock people into using them because some of our survivors, you know, uh, don't have that issue. But we try to keep everything as confidential, which, we, which is really bad when it comes to impact measurement because we literally have very little data <laughs> that we collect uh, because of this, uh, this risk uh, and means we can't always tell how people are engaging with our content. That's a good point, but also really, it's really important to factor that in for your users instead of, instead of impact. So um, do we have any other questions? I have a private question, which I can read out, which is um, by making data more public, how can we also make it easy to, um, so if you can clarify your question again, just to say, um, are you talking about um, the public contracts or the stuff with Chen, then I can answer that question. So um, whoever sent me that message, I'll just wait for them to reply. But yeah, if, you, if anyone else has any other questions, I can answer that in the meantime. I was wondering if you could um, give any advice or tips for our members um, or maybe words of encouragement of if they want to take that next step in their career um, to, to working on their own project. I think my, my biggest advice would be is to um, not procrastinate. Um, that is it's easier said than done, but that's the number one thing that I find is a lot of people who want to start their own projects think so long about things like branding and color schemes and you know what will I call it then actually what is the what am I trying to do and and how, will I keep doing it and also understanding yourself because some people are starters and some people are maintainers and there you have very few people who kind of can do everything so if you're someone who is very good at starting things but you know you lose interest very quickly and you can't keep with it then finding someone who can be that person for you who keeps keeps things going would be really important. Um, I, I'm someone who's motivated by maintaining things um, as well as creating them, which is why Chan has like lasted uh, the seven years with very little money. Uh, but I, that's the, that's one of the reasons why people like um, fail in terms of like sustainability is because it's very hard to keep things going. It requires a lot of grit and outside support. So actually mobilizing your networks uh, is really helpful. So there are a few more questions. Um, I will do them. So the first question was about like how, by making things more open, can we help people understand the issues that we're talking about? I think for when it comes to corruption it is absolutely crucial. The fact that we have data to investigate it makes it like less shrouded in mystery and, and also increases the stakes for people who are involved in illicit money flows because they know that there is a higher chance for them of getting caught because it's all out in the open. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It just makes it much more like riskier. So really important. And when it comes to like gender-based violence, I think that I'm really keen on and actually doing more data projects around uh, uh, crime and how crime is reported and reported because I think that's something that isn't like, you get very high level stats when it comes to police data, when it comes to like you know, court data. And it's a shame that our system, like you know, court data is so useful, but it's really hard to get access on. So I, I submitted a FOIA request, for example, saying, I wanna know how many uh, people had been charged with making a false rape claim. And I wanna know that exactly how many people, I wanna have a breakdown of them by gender as well. And the, what were the outcomes? Were those successful like uh, prosecutions? Because this is a myth that people always say that yes, so many people lie about it. 
And the response I got from the justice, uh, Ministry of Justice was that they just don't collect this information. And if they, they, they could probably find it for a sim like a single court, but it would, it would be so costly so that I would have to like submit it for each of the different courts in the country. And, it, and even then they might not be able to do it. So it's really important for accountability for this kind of data to be collected. And of course, like, you know, keep it anonymous as much as possible and then being published. So we have another question, which is about uh, procurement frameworks. <laughs> that is a really, really good question. Oh, procurement frameworks are the bane of my life, uh, only because um, they are so useful. The reason why they were set completely makes sense, but it's really hard to track um, spends against them because for everyone who doesn't know, procurement frameworks are like, your like large brackets where governments say all these suppliers there's like this set amount and all of these people within that bracket can all claim money from it. So they don't have to run these procurement process all the time. So it actually is quite an efficient way of doing it. But the problem is it's really hard to track because frameworks don't have like identifiers. So you would need to search that in the text that's available within each tender and have to guess whether like a particular spend is related to that tender. So I think it makes it really hard um, to track. And th this is a feedback that we've given to um, cabinet office and they, they are aware of it. So hopefully they will do something about that. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to add them to the chat and maybe here I can answer them throughout the course of um, the event. But otherwise, let's thank her again. Thank you so much. That was really really interesting and and i love hearing about all of the different projects that you work on and all the work that you do um so next up we have alice if you would like to sorry no no problem um do you have any slides you would like yeah. to share i will share my screen uh hopefully this will work Can you see that? Yes. Okay. And that, yeah, that's still working. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I was a little nervous about this because, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I use data, but I don't particularly think about it. So, so this got me thinking a little bit. Um, and so I apologize if it sounds a little bit like, you know, I'm just kind of giving some random thoughts here around climate change and the challenge. Um, around data and complexity, but hopefully you can help me out with, uh, with thinking a little bit more about it because, um, yeah, I've really enjoyed the opportunity I've had to do, actually do some real thinking because my, my job day to day uh, doesn't really get me doing much research at the moment, unfortunately. Um, so my name's Alice Arkin. I am a researcher at the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. Um, and I was asked as well as talking a little bit about climate change to also just give a brief background um, to make my, my sort of trajectory, if you like. And um, so I just want to share this picture because it kind of captures quite a lot of, um, of what this means or what my trajectory has been. Now, this will look like a bit of an odd diagram. It's also a uh, photograph, but it's also not very nicely. It's a bit pixelated. Um, what this is about is that um, I made a transition from uh, what would be a kind of classic physics kind of background into something that was much more sort of policy oriented. And so what I mean by that is I did a, a degree in physics, I then did a PhD in climate modelling, um, and I kind of felt a bit sort of constrained in some ways in terms of, um, you know, getting, getting research out into the public domain and making it make a difference. That was really important to me. So I left academia and thought that I wanted to work in communication ended up working in science communication and being a press officer for a while, uh, which was brilliant. But then I kind of got itchy feet and wanted to carry on with research. So I wondered whether I'd just been in the wrong area of re research. And then this job was advertised at the, uh, well, at UMIST at the time, now University of Manchester, um, for a job in the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. And they were looking for a physicist who could communicate, um, which I don't know if any of you are physicists on this call. Um, but um, my experience from my own degree program was that we weren't great at communicating. So the fact that I'd actually had a chance to work in science communication meant that this appealed to me. And, and for any of you who don't know what the Tyndall Centre is, it's a, it's a national research centre that's spread across a number of different universities. 
but it was set up in the year 2000 specifically to do policy relevant research. So not just to do the research and publish it in journals, but to explicitly go out and engage with policymakers, uh, engage with inquiries and so on. And so that's kind of what this picture is about because one of my early postdoc pieces of work was around aviation and airport expansion and climate change. And when we had a, our first paper published, uh, a couple of uh, nights later, I was sitting watching the news and, um, and there was this story that came up about uh, activists who'd been marching on Gatwick Airport armed with peer-reviewed science. And this is the banner they carried. Um, and they, they actually literally had my paper sellotaped to themselves as kind of armor. Um, which was just a bit shocking really to see and also I had no warning that this was going to be on the news or anything um, but what was really interesting is that so this was when the group Plain Stupid set up and they they started you know doing lots of protests and so on on the basis of climate change and there was lots of other uh, NGO work that was going on in relation to climate change that was really important at the time but it makes you realize that you know your work can be really really influential even if you don't mean it to be and of course it also quite irritated a lot of people in the aviation industry what this research was saying because it was basically showing that our climate change objectives were contradictory to our objectives in relation to airport expansion so you can see why this was picked up um, but this meant that I have been with the Tyndall Centre ever since because I find it an incredibly rewarding place to do research because we don't just keep our, our sort of our research to ourselves we and, and obviously in this world now where social media is so powerful um, you know much more research is is in this kind of direction of having impact and so that's my background just very briefly in relation to climate change so so what I'm going to do now is just briefly uh, show a few things about the scale of the challenge the kind of work I, I do um, and then just pose so you know sort of reflections really in relation to data um, one issue around scale and another issue around complexity so so this is a bit of a depressing graph here so we've got carbon dioxide emissions per year up the left hand side from the global fossil fuel air consumption and how that produces co2 emissions and then you've got time from the pre-industrial revolution along the bottom out to near the present day and this is the data as up to date as we have it um, and it's depressing because the trajectory shows that we're still going up. So despite the fact that, you know, there are lots of fantastic uh, actions and, and policies and, and mechanisms and ways in which we've been trying to deal with climate change, um, we haven't got ourselves off this upward trajectory, although uh, there will be a, certainly a blip to do with COVID and how long this lasts, we, we don't know yet. Um, but when you see those little blips in that graph, this is from the Global Carbon Projects, the data illustrates basically that the little downturns are when we have global economic downturns. So the, the sort of, um, there's a dip there when there was 2000 and, and or, uh, sorry, September the 11th uh, impact that had an impact on our global emissions and the economic ramifications. 2008, the recession also had an impact. Um, and so this is because our activity in terms of consumption is very closely associated and linked to carbon, carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gas emissions that get produced. Um, so, you know, when our economies uh, have a downturn, and so this is why COVID is going to show in this, um, it means that our CO2 emissions go down because we're consuming less stuff, we're doing less, you know, using less energy, doing less things, traveling less and so on. So it's a little bit depressing if we look at the temperature data. So, you know, tons of lots of lovely data out there in terms of climate data and um, so this here is showing you from 1880 out to, to 2020 it's got temperature up the left hand side in terms of the temperature difference between the 1951 to 1980 average and the reason that that period is taken is because although pre-industrial revolution uh, there was less consumption and burning of fossil fuels and therefore climate change has been going on since since the start of the industrial revolution really or at least the the, the co2 concentration has been growing the the trajectory from around the 1950s is is very clear in terms of you know there was more natural variability and so on going on before and it's more difficult to see that that trend in terms of warming and um, so we have had about one degree of warming since around the 1950s uh, on, of global surface mean surface temperatures, um, which never sounds like that very much, particularly when you live in Manchester and you know I grew up in Manchester and you know one degree, you know an extra couple of degrees sounds quite nice. Um, but when you're talking about global averages, obviously you're not. 
that, that is not the, the whole picture. And what we actually experience is we experience weather and we, um, you know, we, we experience weather on a daily basis and we also experience extremes. So extreme weather events, these pictures were all taken last year, uh, all from different events that people were, you know, you can't always associate a particular event to climate change, but basically when the whole globe is about one degree warmer, a lot more energy in the system, and it tends to lead to more extreme weather events. And this can be, you know, drought and therefore more fires. It can be more intense rainfall, um, which is a particular trend we're seeing in the UK and areas like Denmark in the same sort of latitude area. More extreme, um, you know, uh, hurricanes and things like that, where we, we end up, you know, because there is this more energy in the system, we tend to have these more extreme events. And these are the things that we experience, the things that, that you know, we remember that impact on people's lives. Um, and of course, whilst there are impacts in countries like the UK, they are much more devastating in many of the poorer parts of the world, where there isn't the wherewithal to be able to actually deal with these impacts, and there isn't the money, there isn't the infrastructure and the support in the same way that there might be here. So, you know, a really, really worrying trend given that this is just at one degree. Now, I don't know how much you guys know about, about the whole climate change issue, but the, the key number that we're trying to avoid in terms of climate change that was discussed in the global meeting in Paris is a two degree warming. So just one more degree is considered to be dangerous climate change. And in fact, also uh, for many low island, low lying states, islands are concerned with obviously sea level rise. Um, and, and many of the poorer parts of the world, actually one and a half degrees is the level that they would like to see um, us avoid in terms of future warming. So, you know, we're, we've already had this one degree um, and we're not on a great trajectory. So I just want to kind of describe that in terms of, you know, what we need to do and what the implications are for policymakers and then what some of the data issues are. So this, this graph here is similar to the one before, but we're starting in 1990, and this just shows the historical CO2 emissions up the left-hand side there, and we're going out to 2050. Now, before global governments and, and decision makers got together in Paris to discuss you know, how to deal with climate change, uh, we were broadly on a trajectory which uh, got, was getting steeper and was more taking us on like a four degree of warming uh, in the future than this two degrees that we needed to avoid. Um, and part of this is because many countries of the world developing very rapidly, which is a good thing, but developing on the basis again of fossil fuel, which is going to put us in a bad place. And of course, our very high emissions that already are, exist in the wealthy parts of the world. If we wanted to avoid um, this four degrees and get more on this kind of two degree pathway, then this is the kind of path that you need to follow. So in other words, you need to very rapidly stop growing emissions, as I, I was showing you before, they're growing very rapidly. Um, overturn that and, and reduce emissions very quickly. And that's what we needed to be able to do. And that's just for two degrees. I'm not showing you here the one and a half, you know, even lower uh, temperature that we would ideally want to avoid. Now, when countries got together in Paris, each of the countries pledged to reduce emissions by a certain amount. And they did that on the basis of what they felt they could do. And unfortunately, um, their, their sort of pledges, if you add them together, kind of gets us somewhere halfway, to, halfway between the four degrees and the two degrees. Um, so even though countries were saying this is absolutely, you know, the best we can do, it's only going to kind of avoid about a 3.2 degree of warming. And this is a big problem. And I think one of the reasons for that, and one of the areas that we do work on in, in the Tyndall Centre, um, is that uh, it challenges our lifestyles if we actually have to think about how very different we need to be in order to tackle climate change in a really meaningful way. And what I mean by that is that it's easy to think about new technologies. So like we like talking about things like electric vehicles and thinking about how they are gonna help us get ourselves off petrol cars. But shouldn't we really be asking ourselves, well, shouldn't we not be in cars at all in our cities and actually redesigning our cities so that we can use more public transport and cycling and walking and so on. But those kind of things challenge our lifestyles. And I think this is particularly interesting now given all of the COVID stuff that's happened because the response has always been, well, we can't do things that impact on people's lives. Well, we've had to do things that have impacted on people's lives unfortunately because climate change always seems like a problem that's kind of over there or in the future it's very difficult to have policymakers make policy that impacts on people's lives now for reasons of climate change i think it's much more challenging but of course covid has has done this to some extent so that's the challenge you know we we have an awful lot to do if we're going to tackle climate change and, and of course it's really positive to see all the, of the bottom-up movement and the youth movement and extinction rebellion and it's been a really a big roller coaster couple of years really to see those sorts of things really taking off but we're still not quite 
doing what we need to do. So just a few reflections on challenge on the challenges around data um, and, and how we sort of been thinking about this in the Tyndall Center. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's, that's interesting at the moment, given the, the sort of climate emergency, is that about half or over half of local authorities have declared this climate emergency. Um, and in order to do that, they then need to interpret what does this global challenge of climate change, what does the Paris Agreement mean for, for Manchester or, you know, for, for Leeds or wherever it might be? How do we actually downscale this big picture into what we need to do locally? And that is a huge challenge and it is something that uh, the Tyndall Centre has done a lot of work on. Um, and so, uh, oops, uh, yeah. So we have done a lot of work with local authorities and part of the work that we've done has fed into the University of Manchester's own carbon target as well. And it's looking at the global carbon budget. So we have a certain amount of carbon, it's a bit like um, your monthly salary. So you've got a certain amount that you know you can, you can spend over the rest of the century. Um, and then you say, well, okay, well, we've spent this much already, a bit like you might have spent your, you know, all of your, all of your salary in the first week, then you don't have a lot for the rest of the time. And so we, we think about it in this kind of budget approach. Now you take your global carbon budget and you say, well, how much does that mean that we have for the UK? And then how much does that mean that we have for Manchester? Now there's, that is fraught with uncertainty and data challenges. So a global level, there's lots of uncertainty. There's lots of error bars. There are different probabilities of avoiding a two degree target. Um, so that would affect your carbon budget. And then it's, you know, how do you translate that down to a national scale? And what does it mean? What do we mean when we talk about national emissions? Um, and so, you know, one of the interesting things when you think about what national emissions means is that we, one of the, the ways in which we talk about it is we talk about production based emissions. And what this means is you draw a boundary around the UK and you say that all of our emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions, are those emissions that we actually release within our borders. So that misses out things like international aviation, it misses out international shipping, but it also misses out if I, for my laptop, if my laptop was actually produced in another country, say it was produced in China. So the emissions that were used, because they use you know, a certain amount of energy to produce my laptop, that were released in China, actually belong to China and their emissions accounting, they don't belong to the UK, even though it's my laptop and I've bought it for my use. So there are two different ways you could look at it. You could actually take a different approach, whereas rather than just talk about the emissions in the UK and in the UK's boundary, you actually talk about what we call consumption-based emissions, which are all the emissions of UK citizens and the things that they consume and the things that they use, et cetera. And, and that different approach um, for many people seems more appropriate because you're talking about the emissions associated with you know, individual consumption and the people in that country. Um, but in terms of data, it's a huge challenge because when you're talking only about the emissions that are released within our national boundaries, we can get data on things like the energy consumption within our power stations, we can record the amount of fuel that's sold in the petrol stations, um, you know, the amount of gas that's used in our systems to heat our, our homes. When it comes to then understanding what the emissions would have been from the, or, you know, uh, the place where my laptop was actually constructed and, and manufactured, um, then you know, we need as robust data to come from China in order to feed into those accounts as we might have in the UK. Um, and that is obviously when you're talking about things that are made all over the world with supply chains where you have products that move from one place to another in order to come together, that is a huge data challenge. And what people tend to do is they use economic proxies. So they say, well, because we've exchanged this amount of money for the laptop, we'll make an assumption about how much emissions were associated with the production in a place like China um, and, and that's the emissions associated with your laptop. So the problem there is if you're a, a say, a, I don't know, electronic store and you want to say that you've got green credentials and you want to say, well, you know, this laptop is greener than the other laptop, then you would have to know something about the, how that laptop is actually being produced in one country compared to another. Or if it's in, within an, that whole country, so in China, if you've got a production plant that's more green than another, we won't be able to capture that in the data because all it's based on is how much it actually costs, not how much you know, emissions are actually produced. So really challenging issues there around, around data, around consumption and so on. So then if we bring it back to Manchester and you know, the Manchester policymaker, it's like, how, how do you actually deal with this? How do you 
how do you encourage policies that lead to uh, you know improving the situation in terms of a climate emergency and how do you actually measure what we've done you know if we put a policy in place how do we know that we've actually made a difference and actually been able to 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 reduce emissions and these are really big challenges and, and even at something quite simple like road transport within the region how do you know that that road transport isn't somebody who is driving between Leeds and Liverpool and therefore is not a Manchester resident or using you know their emissions coming from the Manchester region but actually you know you're a Manchester policymaker and you want to reduce those emissions and you want to say I'll reduce the emissions from car transport so how do you measure that how do you draw the boundary around it so you can see that there are these these huge issues where we have to make you know big assumptions we have to use proxy proxies we can't always measure the effectiveness of policies um, and this this is is really difficult it's not going to go away uh, it's going to continue to pose us challenges so any thoughts on how we solve any of those sorts of things uh would be really um happy to hear and the last one the last area i just wanted to mention um around data was around complexity so there's a couple of big things here that i think are really interesting so one is that all of our systems are interconnected so we've done a nice project um, that was on what we call the water energy food nexus meaning that if you're looking at energy and energy consumption and how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from energy you can't disconnect that from the food system or from your water system because for example if you want biofuel you might want to grow that biofuel on land that's already used for agriculture now that agricultural land could have could have been used to feed a population or it could be used to give energy to another part of the population but it can't necessarily be used for both and both of them will have different water use needs um, and so you might have an intervention you might have an innovation that looks like it's really good from an energy point of view because it saves energy or it you know uses a more decarbonized kind of energy like anaerobic digestion for example that produces biogas but that might impact on you know food waste streams it might impact on the food sector it might need more water the water industry requires emissions so there might be unintended consequences of these interconnected systems so again this poses lots of challenges around data and around understanding you know whether or not an innovation or a technology is actually going to lead to a positive uh, outcome in terms of climate change and um, and and that's just talking about quantitative data one of the really fantastic things about the Tyndall Center is that we're an interdisciplinary group of researchers. So we have social scientists, historians, politicians, you know, uh, economists, uh, engineers, physical scientists, all working together on the same problem. And often the qualitative data is, is actually what tells us what the bigger picture is or helps us understand the context in which a particular technology might work. So we had this nice project called Stepping Up. And I just uh, just take a, a kind of quote out of this that it was like looking at some of these technologies that people come up with and say, you know, here's your answer to climate change. It's all about uh, burning biofuel and capturing the CO2 and sticking it underground. And then you've got negative CO2 and then we've solved all the issues. And the problem is with any innovation, any technology innovation, when we model it, we tend to assume the same conditions operate all over the world and all we have to do is press the button and in our mathematical way we upscale everything and it works and bingo we've solved the climate problem and of course the reality isn't like that so the value of the things that we do in Tyndall is that we bring in the social science to try to understand some of those other contextual factors that might be that someone just doesn't want one of those technologies actually to be developed in their beautiful forest that they live near um, or you know whatever it might be there might be lots of reasons why you don't actually want or you don't actually you're not able to roll out a technology in a particular way and we're terrible physicists particularly are terrible at just assuming everything works because it's theoretical and can be modeled and therefore it's a solution so this quote is just from one of the conclusions from our, our, our stepping up project so scaling up is not always good and, I, and this is a particular bugbear of mine because of, of how a lot of lot of the rhetoric is around climate change can be solved by technology so when innovation is scaled up for good reason there'll be negative unintended consequences that need to be mitigated and social economic and environmental costs that are accounted for transdisciplinary approaches so these are ones that also involve stakeholders you know real people who do real stuff <laughs> uh, to tease out these issues with data and process transparency as well as trust between stakeholders and important aspects of the mitigation process so despite these challenges, confronting complexity can enable more informed modeling and robust planning. 
but you see there that I think similar to the last speaker, you know, uh, we, we have lots of issues around transparency and trust and data that, you know, need to be tackled if we're going to uh, really solve this climate problem. So just to conclude, downscaling from, from global to local, it amplifies uncertainty and it creates lots of issues, but we don't have time not to do this. So we have to keep going because it's such an urgent problem, but we have to do that in, in the face of uncertainty. The data collection methods that we use tend to influence the policies that we then come up with. Um, and then these economic proxies that we can use to try to look at consumption, they can be really misleading. So you can see why policymakers are not a fan of this consumption-based approach, even though it might feel like the right thing to do. And policymakers want to track success, and that's really difficult. Our systems are connected, makes it even more complicated and complex. And the policies that we put in place can have unintended consequences that we need to reflect on. And finally, I'll just say our over-reliance on quantitative indicators can be misleading. And so just fly a big flag for the social sciences. I probably should have studied social science in some way, but I didn't. So there you go. Uh, so that's it from me. I hope I haven't spoke for too long, but thanks very much for listening. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Can we give Alice a virtual round of applause? Really, really timely um, talk and um, discussion points. Uh, we have two questions in the chat and I'll probably limit it to those two um, uh, for the moment. But if you have more questions, feel free to add them to the chat. And um, if Alice has time before she goes, she can answer them. But sure. the first question is, does the Tyndall Center do research on the correlation or causal relationships around any of the policy areas that you look at? There will be people that do work on this. So we have our headquarters is at University of East Anglia, um, and there are also researchers in Cardiff and in Newcastle. Um, I don't know if anything specific, but um, I could certainly actually go and look to see if I can find out anything else and, and bring that back and feed that back in um, about you know specific research projects. But certainly it's the kind of thing that, that it does you know, fascinate people. So yeah, I will have a look and find out. And then from Rosie about the scale problem, do you find that policymakers in different areas are willing to share accurate data on emissions of different industries? And is this a purely technical problem or is it also a political one? Um, I mean, the policymakers kind of, um, they're often not the ones that have the data themselves. So, you know, the, it'd be, it'd be like the um, Bayes and government um, departments that will collect certain data. So Bayes would collect sort of the energy data, if you like, by different industries. Um, there are obviously commercial sensitivities around some organizations, but because, you know, we've signed up to things like in the past, signed up to Kyoto um, and through the United Nations, um, the, the various climate conventions that we have to actually, um, we have to be transparent about the data. So, so the data sets that we have by different industries, you know, should be correct in terms of they, you know, they should be transparent and open because we can't, we're not supposed to hide that kind of information. And um, so, so, you know, that is shared and, and we can, we can look at that. What you probably can't do is look at it as an organization by organization. So, you know, you wouldn't be able to pick out a particular part, you know, a particular organization within an industry, but we would be able to look, say, look at the chemicals industry as a whole for CO2 and so on. But, but I mean, it's right that, of course, politics plays a huge role in all of this. It's not just about technology and data. Um, it's, it's also about what, what organizations would like to say that they're doing rather than what they're actually doing. And so if you actually wanted to monitor a particular organization and whether or not they're actually reducing their emissions, that kind of thing would be more difficult to get. So you can get it nationally, you can get it by sector, but you can't get it by organization or company. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for um, coming to speak to us. Um, I was Pleasure. totally blown away by your um, TED talk and the, like, the scale of how much we would have to change our lifestyle in order to, to really mitigate the risks. So um, maybe some of that will happen during the COVID uh, situation, but I don't know if it'll be extreme enough, but it'll be interesting to see what kind of effect and how more willing we are to change our lifestyles after this. So thank you so much. Um, and our final speaker now is Sefi. If you would like to unmute. Hi. Hello. Yes. Okay, here we go. Perfect. Yep, all good. Great. Um, so, uh, 
Yeah, I'm Sophie. Uh, I'm the COO and co-founder of Disposal. And frankly, I never thought that this is where I'd end up. But thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, like Alice, don't really think about myself as like a data person. And so I was also a little bit nervous about, um, about doing this talk. Um, but weirdly, in prepping for it, I kind of came to the realization that actually a lot of my jobs have had data um, in the, at the core of them, I suppose, um, but on a kind of fairly small scale. And since founding Disposal, I now find myself talking about waste and data quite a lot. Um, it's been a bit of a weird route for me to get here. Um, I've had a bit of an unusual life. Um, so here's a few examples of that. So I was born in rural southern India and I lived there until I was six. Um, my parents worked on a project that provided healthcare and basic facilities to people who otherwise didn't really have access to it. Um, and when I was little, people said I spoke Tamil like a Tamil, although I have completely forgotten it all now. Um, uh, I took six years out after quitting my A-levels um, before going to the University of Bradford to study conflict resolution. Um, after university, Tom and I um, lived and worked on a, a sustainable education centre in Dorset for a year and a half, uh, which our friends jokingly referred to as the commune. Um, and then I did like a whole load of weird jobs in catering and hospitality before getting into supply chain and logistics. And then uh, in 2015, Tom and I quit our jobs and set off on a kind of pretty epic cycle tour around uh, North America. So we spent uh, about nine months cycling 8,700 miles. Um, and it was during this time that Tom came up with the idea for disposal. Um, and you can see from this map that not taking a straight route anywhere is sort of a theme of my life. Um, and we called, we called our blog Detour to Moosejaw, which we went to and we met the mayor, it was great. Um, so, I mean, at this point in my life, actually I wanted to work for like MSF or some other humanitarian relief agency and I wasn't planning on getting involved in disposal, but I am really glad that I did. Um, after we got home, we started uh, sort of researching the tech or Tom was researching that and I kind of started looking into figuring out how you go about setting up a company and you know when we'd been cycling we'd listen to the podcast startup so we were totally well informed about the process um no i mean in all honesty like we learned a lot in those early months um and then in june 2017 we quit our jobs again took a month off to have like a little adventure and holiday before starting full-time on disposal so we went sea kayak touring around northern norway uh and Here's one of the photos from the one of the couple of days where it was nice and kind of as we'd imagined it to be. And then the rest of the time it was more like this. <laughs> and uh, frankly, it's really lucky that we actually didn't die. Um, so we began to kind of work on the company in earnest in July 2017. We launched our platform in March 2018. And then we've been um, iterating and pivoting and improving and learning since then. So what is Disposal about? So I think that much of the world has woken up to the fact that we have a problem with our rubbish or recycling or trash or junk, whatever the word it is that you use, um, because of Blue Planet 2 and various things like that. But despite the fact that waste is something that everyone creates like almost no one really understands it and understands what happens um, and at disposal what we're trying to do is make it easier to understand and to bring some transparency and accountability to the waste supply chain so generally people who aren't in the waste industry imagine that waste works a bit like this it's a simple chain you put something in the bin the bin gets emptied it gets taken away by a waste company and then it gets recycled landfilled or incinerated and most people also think that their responsibility to that waste ends when it's taken away by a waste contractor. But actually, the waste supply chain looks a lot more like this. It's a complex web of interwoven waste companies which span the globe. And as far as UK legislation goes, you're legally responsible for your waste until it reaches its end destination. But keeping track of that and, and trying to make sure it doesn't end up in the wrong hands, a, a red dot in this example, a waste criminal, it's really complicated and it's time consuming and frankly it's virtually impossible with the way things are currently. But you do have a legal obligation to check. So I'm going to walk you through an example, a real life example of uh, trying to check a, 
a waste company's credentials that we went through for a, for a, a client of ours. So they use a company called Olico and on their supplier database, they have them down with two addresses. One is their head office and one is a site in Bristol. So in England, the regulator for waste is the Environment Agency or the EA, and they have a website with all the waste permits and licenses on and it's called the public register so i want to check that olico are licensed and that to get their license or permit number for this bristol site by using the quick search so using their company name returns me 32 results but when i then filter to find the bristol one there's nothing uh oh so uh okay i'm going to use the search all registers function using the postcode that i have to see if that gives me anything to go on so uh that returned me 58 results um but none of them were for olico so okay uh if i look at the full address that we've been given by our client um so the first line of the address actually says genico so i google genico um cool they're a food waste company that looks promising um and they have a location in the same postcode excellent uh, but when I go back to check for Genico on the Environment Agency site, the results are zero. Okay, so back to Genico's website, maybe I can find some more clues. Oh good, they've got a resources section um, and a bit with licenses and permits. So I uh, click to download the permit and I get a PDF with the permit on it, which is great but the name of the company operating the site is Wessex Water Services Limited, which just seems weird. So, okay, I'm gonna go and put that permit number into the Environment Agency search again and check it's legit. Okay. Mm, ah, okay, no, I have a vague memory that actually the EPR slash bit, even though it's in the permit number, causes some issues. So I'm gonna take that out and okay, great. So now, you it's a legitimate license that's great but i still don't understand why genico are providing me with a license for a different company so i go back to the genico website and i notice that they've got a wessex water logo on their footer and then you know just a quick check on company's house confirms that yes okay genico are owned by wessex water i mean what a ridiculous process so i mean and imagine that you you've got 50 sites or 500 sites in your waste supply chain and you have to do this sort of check on all of them and the thing is is this kind of issue where the operator's name doesn't match the permits happens a lot in fact there are a ton of data quality issues um, like the fact that addresses might be presented in five different ways or a company a company's name is put in in the, a dozen different formats right and and those permits like the one downloaded from Genico's website, despite being issued by the EA, aren't centrally stored anywhere in a digital format. So that if the EA officer needs to check the details of a site's permit, they literally have to go and dig the paper copy out from a filing cabinet. And these inefficiencies make meeting your legal obligations space really hard. And most people we've spoken to who take their waste compliance seriously and sadly there's lots of people who don't but those that do spend hours painstakingly updating spreadsheets and creating calendar notifications to remind them to check documents and even the most diligent get caught out and miss things and part of the reason for this is that much of the industry still runs on paper and the regulators don't have the digital infrastructure to make their lives or our lives easier DEFRA conducted a review into serious and organized crime in the industry and found that the lack of digital record keeping made it very easy for criminals to exploit the system. And serious and organized crime are taking huge advantage of this low risk, high reward industry at the expense of taxpayers, the environment and legitimate businesses. So the cost of waste crime to the economy of England is estimated at over 600 million a year with the total cost of the UK being around a billion. I mean, it's so bad that the head of the Environment Agency has called waste crime the new narcotics. So we think we need to digitalize the industry and we need to make it easy for people to do the right thing so that we can disrupt the criminal activity and keep waste in the legitimate system. So here's like a couple of quick examples of how disposal simplifies those currently manual compliance tasks. 
So this is our peace of mind dashboard. You sign up, you follow the waste contractors that you use and disposal will notify you when their licenses are approaching expiry and when they expire and when they've uploaded new ones. And we use this, uh, like as in we do this via the environment agency API of the public registers, but then we've augmented that information. And you can quickly see that like we've got color coded visuals to help people notice if there's anything that looks at risk. And we've got the ability to export that information in either a PDF or an Excel report. So alongside those sort of paid for compliance tools, which are aimed at organizations and businesses, we also have a free to use directory of licensed waste sites and a waste thesaurus, which is our most popular tool. Like we've got tens of thousands of people around the globe that use it. Um, and we've linked tens of thousands of keywords uh, around waste to the European waste catalog code. So it can make it a lot easier for people to classify the waste that they need to. So one customer, Rosie, who's the waste manager at a university told us that she used the thesaurus to dispose um, of, uh, sorry, she used it when she had to classify a load of waste that she needed to dispose of uh, when she was decommissioning an old site. And she'd expected this tedious job to take about three weeks, but using the thesaurus, it took her like a couple of days. Um, so we've also developed an API to allow organizations to make use of it um, within their own systems. And um, I think that it's clear we're building useful stuff because our site traffic is growing month on month. So um, we saw nearly 9,000 visitors in April, which was an increase of 250% on April last year. Um, and due to like massive confusion by most people about what's happening at recycling centers or your local tip, if you like, we've seen over 20,000 visitors in May. So we're starting to have an impact and that's important to us because we're a mission driven business. Um, and I guess the kind of the impact that we're aiming for is sort of under four general categories. So the first is around passive compliance. So we want to make doing the right thing the easiest thing so that we can tackle waste crime and the subsequent environmental, societal and economic costs. And our compliance tools are going some way towards achieving this, which is great. The second impact is around laying the foundations. And I mean, in some ways, this is way above our station. We're a tiny organization, but we can see what needs to be done to enable the waste industry to go through meaningful digital transformation that benefits the whole ecosystem. And so we're having a go at it. Um, Last year, we finished a three month project working with DEFRA on a smart waste tracking um, system, which we worked on with Open Data Manchester. Um, and we believe that there's a, a need to build um, a national and frankly international um, open waste data standard that can then allow kind of a tech infrastructure to be built on top of that. And in doing that, I think we would prime the entire industry to, to actually develop much needed innovation. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to keep working with DEFRA on this project. And while elements of our approach seem to have been taken forward, like one part that hasn't is the open data standard. So we're still working with Open Data Manchester to see if we can find ways to continue to develop the prototype that we released at the end um, of the project. Because we just think it's absolutely critical to having a functioning, meaningful digital system. Um, and being able to digitally track waste is important and we think it will enable our third impact area, which is to bring transparency and accountability, which is key to having a healthy, responsible waste industry. And we've heard about how important those things are from the other two speakers. Um, we will, I mean, we'll continue to raise awareness around this through speaking events and such like, but it, we need a kind of we need a system that allows good open data on waste that can allow the kind of wider community and other organizations to kind of interrogate that and link it and analyze it. And ultimately our kind of big goal is for society to move from the kind of linear wasteful take, make, dispose kind of culture to a, a circular economy where no materials are wasted and precious resources are preserved and that the value and the actual cost of the materials is properly understood. Like so much of the stuff that we produce and consume has a longer life after it's discarded than while it's actually in use. And yet we have almost no visibility of its journey once it's thrown away. And the circular economy is about so much more than just, you know, recycling on steroids, but 
to allow us to transition to a more regenerative, sustainable economy, we need to understand that crucial part of a product's journey so that we can reimagine and redesign and reuse and repair. And I think because waste is such an enormous global problem, it also means that this is an enormous opportunity to have a massive global impact. And, but only if we develop like real useful solutions, because like Alice was saying that these are complex, you know, systemic problems and everything's connected and it's not going to be a kind of a simple quick fix. But to me, this is really exciting. And I'm so glad that I found myself at this rubbish startup trying to make sense of this completely insane, but also like insanely important industry. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sophie. Let me stop sharing. There we go. Virtual <laughs> round of applause for Sophie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, do we have any? Oh, we do have a question um, from Elisa. If you want to unmute yourself and ask your own question, you can. Otherwise, I can read it out. Hi, I can ask. Hi, Sophie. Hey. Um, yeah, that was such a great presentation. Thank you. And I totally agree with open data. And this is something I've been wondering too, you know, how do we actually encourage open data for waste? Who should be responsible for this? Well, I mean, it, this is a trigger. So I, I mean, I think that, that it should be the government, right? I think DEFRA uh, as the kind of overall kind of department responsible for that should be, um, should be pushing for that. But I also think that we as individuals have a part to play and actually if we started being more curious about what happens to the stuff when we put it in the bin and we start asking those questions and as organizations we start asking and demanding that information from our from our waste supply chain then then i think that you know that actually the markets might be forced to respond even if government doesn't move on it and so i i you know when i give this talk i kind of often ask people at the end to kind of just start being more curious about what happens to that and, and not just accept a kind of shiny report by your waste contractor that goes zero to landfill because frankly that's actually complete rubbish nothing is zero to landfill because there's always something left over always and so actually asking those questions around well no i really want to know and i want to see the data about what actually happens and and what's going on with it and so yeah i mean i think we all have a part to play but i hope it will be led by by government um because i think frankly that's where it should the responsibility should sit but yeah thank you uh does anybody else have any questions you can feel free to unmute yourself um is there anything an average person can do to like, I just let the council collect my waste. I try to recycle. What else can I be doing? Okay. So, um, I mean, in terms of the stuff that you put out for the council, then, um, not a lot. D d one thing I would say is don't do what's kind of jokingly referred to as like wish cycling, which is like, Oh, if I put this in the bin, even though they haven't put it on the list of things they take. So like in Manchester, you're only allowed to put plastic bottles in the plastic recycling thing, right? They only take things that are shaped like a bottle. So don't think, Hmm, well, I've heard other places do tubs and trays or I've heard other places do bags or so I'm just going to put them in because they're going to recycle them. That's not how it works. And actually, that's just contamination and you'll just ruin the whole load. So um, if they tell you to put certain things in, please follow their instructions. They do that for a reason. It's to do with their contracts and stuff. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing in terms of as a normal person, it's knowing that you even as a householder have a responsibility if you employ somebody to take away your waste that isn't the council. So say you were clearing out your shed or you were having some building work done, it's, it's on you to make sure that the person that takes away that waste is uh, licensed. And so just make sure that you've checked that they've got a proper waste carriers license and, and ask them for a written receipt. So um, you know what's happened to the waste and who they are. And so that if it finds itself dumped in a lay by, you can um, show that you did everything that you, should have done and then point the police in the direction of the person who took it away from you and dumped it um i mean on a on a bigger scale like i said i think just being curious about it and and asking questions um both at work and at home is um is important 
Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for those questions. Um, I just want to say that I, I think I met Sophie for the first time. I think it was at a She Says Manchester meetup. And were you asking a question about building confidence as a public speaker? I think um, you've yeah. come an amazing way. Thank <laughs> you so much. You totally confident. Um, uh, it's been a long time. I should have asked you to speak a lot sooner. So thank you so much for that. That was um, really great. And also thank you for highlighting um, kind of nervousness at, at approaching a herpless data talk because I do think a lot of people assume that what they do isn't related to data when really data is very broad and we we try to make our scope extremely broad to try and include as many people as possible because um, data affects all of us in, in different ways and um, I think it's really important to highlight all of the different um, projects and initiatives and organizations out there um, working with data. So thank you so much. Um, so can we just give a final virtual round of applause to all of our speakers? Really appreciate you taking the time. I know all of our days are completely full of, of video calls. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stick around for a little while longer if anybody wants to stick around and network. But otherwise, thank you so much to everybody who attended and, and engaged. We really appreciate you coming. Um, Sam, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, just a huge thank you. I really, to all the three speakers, they were really, really fascinating, all of you. And um, just thank you again for, for um, you know, the collaboration and for inviting me along as well. I was going to say, we were supposed to be in the Federation building tonight, but I think we'll be online for the foreseeable future. Okay, so thank you so much to everybody who came. Um, and thank you to our speakers and thank you to Open Data Manchester. And hopefully we'll see you next month.